Tell me if this is a true story because it's, it's a legendary story. Uh, Loverboy was in the States, Dick Asher, CBS, Turn Me Loose, records singing along, <laughs> debuts in the charts at 89, it's at like eight weeks, it's about 37. Dick Asher decides or figures out that he's paying about 30% of his profit to the indie Purdue promoters, decides that he's going to pull the plug. Yes. The indie promoters, the network, decides to get together and teach him a lesson. A couple of examples, yes. The record falls, plummets <laughs> off the charts. Off the charts. How did, was that true and how did you say that? It's dead true. They made an example of two acts. They made an example. They were going to say, we're going to make an example of a new act. How about those lover boy guys? Bang, they were gone. The other one was uh, The Who, which was the established yeah. act. I think they had squeeze boxes some other time and they were gone. So I went to uh, Dick Ash and I said, listen, and there was another, there's a black act in there at the same time talking, I think it was the Commodores or somebody had the same type of problem. And I remember sitting and I said, listen, you know, it's fine for you, Dick, you're making half a million dollars a year and you're going to have a career. I got one chance here. And those guys, I mean, I got more than one, but the band's got one chance. This is their shot. You can't kill them with this, with this uh, edict. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we're doing it. That's the way it's going to be. And I always wondered, you know, Dick Asher, funny sideline. Every time you went into an Ash, a Dick Asher meeting, I'll continue with that. But every time you went into a Dick Asher meeting, there was a guy that came in and shined his shoes. So you're talking to this guy, and he's got some guy shining his shoes. And he says to you, How you want your shoes shine? I was convinced that guy worked for Warner Brothers and knew more about <laughs> what was going on with CBS than most of the people at CBS. So anyway, I went downstairs to, um, to my product manager, who at that time was Arma Anden, and a great guy. And I said, listen, Arma, we're getting screwed here. You know we can't survive. I mean, I don't make the rules here. I just play in the game. If that's the way we're going to pay it, it's going to cost us $100, or what was it going to cost in those days? $150 for a, um, a, a C market, $500 for a B market, or parallel tour they called them in those days, and $1,000 for, for an A market. We've got to pay this stuff, or we're not going to get played, and you've got to help me. So we came up where we used to um, falsify tour support statements. So he said, get the band on the road, keep them out there, just send me backup, send me bullshit numbers, right. and I'll just pay as tour support. And I was, a guy who used to control all that at times was a guy called Freddie DiCipio. And um, he used to, the, I, then I had to take all the orders. I had, to, I had to get all the charts and I had to get all, figure out all the money. And he used to phone me to give me the, the, the charts and how much it was going to pay me, how much I would have to pay him. So he'd phone up and I'll, invariably, he's on the East Coast, I wasn't home yet. And my girlfriend at the time would pick up the uh, phone and she'd say, hello? And she, he'd say, uh, Bruce Allen's resident? Yeah, he says, who's this? He says, she'd say, this is Jane. She says, okay, Jane, listen to these stations. Uh, under 150, write these call letters. He'd name all these call letters down. Under 500, write all these call letters. He'd write them all down. Under 1,000 bucks, write all these call letters. Then I used to add them up when I got home and tell Army, you know, make up some false tour support things, and he'd send the Scipio a check. Well, years later, a couple years later, 18 months later, we came to the Juno Awards here in New York, in uh, Toronto, and... Um, Jane was with me and we walked into the room and Bernie DiMatteo was the president at that time at, at CBS. So I walked up and said, Jane, I would like to meet Bernie DiMatteo. Oh, Mr. DeCipio, you're the guy who calls in with all those numbers. We have to spend all the money to get our records played. He, no, 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 I know nothing about that guy, you know, because he had to report to Dick Asher. But basically, they, 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 they stayed out of the business for a while of doing that stuff and, um, and uh, it's, it's gone away now, but it's resurfaced in a much uglier form than I ever thought that was. Um, because I did, I could relate to you know. Here's some dough, play the record. Here's a refrigerator. Here's a broad, whatever you had to do. I that's fine with me, okay. And um, and but now what they've done now is they say okay, now we have BDS. That you used to report these records, hot, medium, light. It was just bullshit. Didn't mean anything of this. Here, report it hot. Here's a broad. You know, and they, they do that. But now, now they do it by spin counts. They watch it on the radio. Everybody's monitored. They see how long they spin your record. So what they're doing to acts now, young acts, is the radio stations say, listen, you get the act into town for me to play a free show and I'll spin your record board. Mm. So we got all these acts going in there playing radio shows for 10,000 people because they all get in free. Or if it's the call letters are 99.6, that's, that's the, uh, the, uh, the price for the tickets, 99 cents. So these acts are going in there, they're the records are getting played, the acts are going in there playing free shows. As soon as they leave town, so. I mean, the, the, the equipment door hasn't shut, the record's <laughs> dropped, they're driving on to the next free show, and they wonder why they haven't got a base, because no promoters, the promoters are getting knocked out, everybody's getting knocked out, because radio station says, if you want to get played on my station, and you've got to give me something, and usually it's free shows, and it's killing these acts, it's killing them, and it's a worse form of payola than it was giving some guy an air conditioner.
So give that a price tag then. What is it when, when to cost to break an, a new and emerging act in the States right now, assuming that the dollars are, are, are tourist support dollars, translate it for me. Well, Randy Burswick would know it a lot better than me because he works in my office and does all that crap and gets losing his hair over this. But I mean, you know, if I if I have to go down and, and even if with Brian fooling around on a single because of a high priced band and the way we travel and stuff like that, some of those shows might cost us twenty five to thirty thousand dollars out of our pocket to do that a record company underwrites. And, and, and it's, I'd rather them take that twenty five or $30,000 and put it into marketing than I would play a free show for some radio station who can be a big shot in the market. Because I think, I, think that, I think that it's just killing these acts and it's killing the concert business. And it, it, it's, a, it's a tragedy what they're making these acts do for airplay. Mm -hmm. and, and then we go out, I got a con line, that's why I got in the country music business. I got a con line crush on tour. They, they now make maybe 750 a thousand bucks playing clubs, doing these radio shows here and there. I mean, what, how much money are you losing a week doing that? You got a bunch of guys sitting in the con line van ricocheting across the country, just playing to 200, 300, 400 people at a time. That's, the country business is a lot different. They support their acts a lot. Radio is very important, but the acts also support radio in much different ways. But they sit there and they, if you have an act that sells as many records as Econline Crush does, and it's a country act, they're making $5,000 a night. Mm -hmm. Martina McBride, who hasn't sold a ton of records, probably made a million, four million, five on this record, will probably can do now forty to fifty thousand dollars a night in concerts, and, there's, and, and then I'm looking at I'm looking at uh, at these acts that are going into the clubs in Vancouver after selling a million records. How much money are they really making? And the country acts work a lot harder, but they also work with radio. They go in there, radio comes in, they talk to radio. Radio is very important to the country artists. And so far, so far, the country business hasn't made us jump through hoops and play a lot of live free shows for them. Yeah, and yet, yeah, a part of country's problem at the moment is that they, they've emulated the whole rock and roll situation to the point that it's become very fickle and doesn't have the longevity it used to. Well, the country business never looked after their older artists. The rock and roll artists did a lot, rock and roll business did it a lot better than the country artists ever done it. Like, where is Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings, and all these people? They just disappeared, George Jones, and so on and so forth. The country business has a problem because they got this weird guy at the top of the charts, Garth Brooks, who's actually sold, made, trying to sell 100 million records. I mean, nobody ever here in here has ever heard of a song, but he's going to sell 100 million records. He's going to be the, one of the first guys to do it. He's only been paid on 50 because he's chopped his royalty so much. He's putting out box sets for 14 bucks and playing concerts and sellouts and think, look at all the people I'm doing. I'm six nights in Minnesota. Well, of course, any asshole could be six nights in Minnesota if he charged 19 bucks for a ticket, Garth. But I mean, you know, he, think, he thinks it's great. But I mean, it's, that's, that's the problem of the country business because everybody else coming up is trying to emulate that. And when you've got the leader of the industry saying, I'm working for 20 bucks and selling my records for a dollar, it's, it's pretty tough for the rest of us to make a living and justify charging 35 bucks or, or charging retail prices for our music. It's mm. tough. Mm. But he's now a baseball player anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about Martina for a second because you wanted to say, you, want, you told me you wanted to tell stories today. And I remember Martina's record, and I can't remember the name of the record, but it was the one about spousal abuse. Independence Day. Independence Day. So the record came Simpson, out. If O.J. Simpson had not knocked off Nicole Brown, she'd have still been trying to get breakthrough on country radio. Well, that was the trick, wasn't it? It wasn't yeah. being accepted a country. It wasn't, no. O.J. thing happened. O.J. thing you happened, man. I rubbed my hands with glee. <laughs> so I said, here's the song. It was an opportunistic, uh, taking was an op advantage of an was evil lucky. situation. It was taking advantage of an evil situation, and, yeah. and they used it as a as the country radio jumped on it immediately. Yeah. And because uh, that song was struggling, when Gretchen Peters wrote that song, she never thought any, anybody would ever record it because it was too controversial. Right. But it became an anthem, and uh, we've done very, very well with it. Well, same thing with Garth Brooks, Thunder Road, Spousal Abuse. Yeah, okay. Came an anthem, pen. The thunder <laughs> rolls. Come on, we can sing it. All Tell I know is high, low friends, and high, high friends, and low play. I don't know. What yeah. <laughs> He wishes he was sticks. You know, that's really what he wishes he was sticks. Yeah, or, or yeah, that's what it shows like. You know? Well, the country, uh, it's a big crossover right now at the moment. Yeah. Next. Who? I, that's what he's going to do, crossover and be six. Going to be sticks. Yeah. yeah Shania is doing it, Dixie Chicks, it's all. It's Dixie Chicks aren't crossing over. Dixie Chicks at least have some credibility. VH1 wanted to play their video because all you video channels, when you see somebody that's hot, no matter what format it's in, you'll sit there and try to get it on the radio somehow, on the TV somehow. So they went to the Dixie Chicks and said, we'll put this on, I'll tell you what, but take out the fiddle. Hmm. And they at least had the artistic integrity to say, stick it, I play the fiddle. So they ain't getting played on VH1, so they might not cross over. They haven't yet. Mm. Mm. We'll see. <laughs> The country, yeah, 10% of the market, the shot at 50% of the market. I don't know. I'm thinking about crossing over. Anyway, <laughs> let's, let, let me give you some quotes back at you. Donald K. Donald today referred to, to uh, a quote you said, better, business would be better without the artist. Now, I have no doubt you said that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what was the context of it? It would be a great business without the artist. Yeah. yeah. What was the context? Remember? Yeah, because I think that, um, I think that we have a tendency in, in the management and the business to 
we, we're fixers, okay? We take a problem and we fix it, but we get bogged down in minutia. Mm. And so many times artists, while they're worrying about the writer or they're worrying about who the opening act is, or if they're worrying about where they're on the bill and this and that, which is really kind of irrelevant things, if they just let us sit down and guide their careers, we'd, get a, we'd do a hell of a lot better. Mm. So I say, wouldn't this, I've sometimes said, this would be a fantastic business without the artist. You know, and I know that's going to haunt me, and I'm it's probably going to cost me about four. You know, I know what's going to happen tomorrow when I go to New York and talk to Brian. He said, "You say this?" You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I have to defend myself against my own artists, which is better than defending myself against everybody else's artists. <laughs> well, I remember in the early days, you had, and talking about your early musical taste, you you were allegedly hated the Beatles. Yeah. Loved Elvis. Yes. And my sense is that your fascination was probably as big for Elvis as it was for Colonel Parker. No. I no. Colonel Parker was a was a perfect example of management that was terrible. I think mm. he did a terrible job. I think he had a, some, uh, uh, he had a real bull by the horns, didn't know how to ride it, and just milked it to death and did a crummy job. If Colonel Parker knew what he was doing, Elvis Presley would be here today. But Elvis was a guy who took his advice and followed his leadership, which yes, is why he, he did. was for good wrong management. Wrong guy. The guy was some Dutch guy who couldn't leave the country. He was a carny guy. He just picked the wrong guy. Huh. You know, and he should have listened to Eddie Arnold, who fired him years before. So what's Elvis a metaphor for? I mean, Elvis, you know, he had a lot of reasons for a lot of people to like him and, and adore him. But in terms of the music business, there's a perfect metaphor for what you should do, what you shouldn't do, how you live your life, that kind of thing. You think? What is he a metaphor for? Mm -hmm. I don't think he's, I don't know if he's a metaphor for anything, except I think that he was first. And I think that he was the one who captured America. I think he was the trailblazer for all of us. And he, he, when he started, he made rock and roll dangerous. And uh, I think that uh, he lost that as it got older, but I mean, that's going to happen. But I think we've, not a lot of people uh, have remembered that that's what rock and roll should be initially. Go to these clubs now, Denise. I mean, you watch kids in clubs now, I mean, it's pretty docile. Mm. It's, you know, it's not really aggressive, I think. And, and, I, and I miss some of the aggressive. I don't know. Every time we do a live show, I spend half my time on the stage screaming, no surfing, that guy out, that guy okay. out, that guy it's, out. Isn't that a phenomenon, mm. okay? The worst thing you could be when you were a musician, what every band tried to get away from on the way they were coming up was playing for dancers. They sat up there in the stage like this, people danced in the club and they played them songs, Beatles songs or whatever songs. And it was quite, it's not what they wanted to do. People always wanted to play their own stuff. So then you got the rock and roll thing came and people started doing their own stuff. And people looked up to those guys. It was, it was tremendous and people were riveted on them and they, they knew all their lyrics, they knew all their guitar licks, they knew what they stood for, they knew everything about them. And now we come to this thing where you have these surfers mm -hmm. and you have stage divers and all the rest of it. I think that's just as insulting as playing for dancers. Nobody's paying attention. Nobody gives a shit. You're the background for a rumble. Okay? People banging into each other. Nobody cares. If I was an artist, I would be really pissed off to have guys on my stage diving in front of me, flying through the air, this and that. Who's paying attention? That's, I think it's sad. Well, it's evolved into an experience. But you've talked, you know, and, and just a moment ago and, and listed a number of acts that you thought were lame and they didn't know how to entertain and all the rest of that. And my sense is, you know, as, as Pink Floyd was to the Sex Pistols in the 90s with the start of grunge, that we're in for a big, big change right now. Do you see it? Well, the trouble is, I think, you know, I think, oh good, Bruce Springsteen's putting the East Street Band back together. Isn't this going to be great? But the, prob the problem is it's going to be nostalgic. Right. I mean, so no what's how the we, new thing? What's I the, don't know. Yeah. I you really, feel that well, we the new thing, it. I guess the new thing, the only people that really entertain that I've seen lately is, I hate to say it, is the young, young girl, young kids act like, like the Spice Girls. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to the show, they are what they are. But at least it's an entertaining package. Same with the Backstreet Boys. It's an entertaining show. Okay, you don't have to like it, but they do a good job of what they do. And I think, I don't know, these things, of course, you don't usually don't carry your 13-year-old heroes past your 15th birthday. Exactly. So I think they'll, 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 there'll be a turnover. But I, I'm sure that something will come along where there'll be a great entertainer. There's some people talk about this kid from England, Robbie Williams. Some people think this might be the start. I think it was neat to see this kid. Who ever heard of this guy? I never heard of this guy. The guy on the Grammys the other night, the... Uh, uh, Latin kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought he did. He did a great job uh, for somebody I never heard of. So, so I think I think there's always cycles, and I think people are gonna. I think people are gonna say, hey, you know, this guy's great. This guy's a great entertainer, and, and I hope it happens. And I hope that uh, I hope that uh, it happens soon because we're losing our business of things that are more entertaining to kids, whether it's Nintendo, Sega, or any other other another number of other things. And we also are forcing these acts to put out albums so quickly so quickly, Denise, that the albums aren't very good. The kids have woke up to the fact, and that's why you people are making a fortune on things like big shiny tunes, mm -hmm. and that's why there's soundtracks on a lot of records, because at least the people know when I buy these songs with 12 songs on it, 
10 of them, I'm going to like, and 12 of them will be good. Yeah. Well, I was talking the other day to a journalist who, who, you know, the old question is why is it that Celine and Alanis and Barenaked Ladies and Sarah and are all working right now? It's because they all had time to develop. They all yes, toured. They did. When they finally got the shot, they could deliver. Yes, they and could. And let me just carry that through for a second because you were talking a minute ago about the Spice Girls and Backstreet Boys. But here's a situation where manufactured, put together, fabricated entity blows big out at radio and video, comes into town, does big, huge shows, doesn't do little clubs. Mm -hmm. And then occasionally when they try and put these kind of acts in the clubs, they put them in nightclubs and 13-year-olds are suddenly going in with yeah. big, ugly bouncers and there's, you know, nobody can handle it. So then the middle ground now for, for live club action is suddenly pulled out. There isn't anything there. That's so let's talk about SFX and that, the live concert business. Where, what state are we at? Well, uh, uh, Everybody seems to be worrying about SFX. Um, a lot of people aren't worrying about them because they're getting rich because of SFX. And they, people asking me what I'm going to keep doing. I've always worked for an independent promoter in the States with Don Fox. He hasn't been bought out yet because he doesn't own any real estate. And as soon as this, and, and I will work with SF, F, SFX guys too because I like Jack Boyle. I think he's a good promoter and I'll work with him. I'll work with Delsner or, or Mitch Slater in New York. I've always worked with them in New York. I don't care what company they're with. And I'll, so I'll still work with them. I think. I think there's all, as soon as there's one somebody at the top that's got everything, there's always something coming up underneath because, because there has to be. That's just the way it is. So there's going to be opportunities for, for people. There are, there's, there's going to be somebody who's going to go out there and say, listen, I've got a good idea. And, and somebody like me, a manager, is going to buy it, mm -hmm. and, it and then they're going to have a they're going to have a business. But then the venues are controlled in a way. That well, what venues isn't are controlled anymore? What venues? You know, there's a saying: you play the sheds when you're dead. Okay, and so he controls a bunch of sheds. So you know, go downtown and play. You can still play downtown, and uh, and and in and in bigger uh, in performing arts centers, there's still venues around. And I, I believe to this day that an audience would rather go an artist for sure. An artist, for sure, we'll start with that, would rather play in the Montreal Forum or Maple Leaf Gardens or the new building here or General Motors Place than they would in any amphitheater. Mm. Okay, because invariably, especially in the States, you start, the show's on, it's still daylight, you got any number of problems. You know, it's not, you can't present yourself as best you can in an enclosed arena. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to take a left turn here. Okay. Because, uh, as, as many of you may know, uh, maybe even contributed to the climb, uh, Bruce climbed uh, Kilimanjaro uh, recently. It's it's the uh, highest mountain in Africa. Yeah. Eight million something meters. No, no, it's 19,000. I don't know about meters. I'm still in feet. Yeah, 19,540 <laughs> feet or something. Yeah. <laughs> 10,000 10, uh, 10, people attempt it. Only 1,000 ever reach the top. Yeah. They say one in 10, yeah. One in 10. A grueling experience. You, you trained to, yeah. to get ready for the experience. And it's not about training. It's more of a head trip. Um, yeah. We had a great guide. He took us up slowly enough that we could acclimatize ourselves, and we made it up there. And um, it was a very interesting experience. Would I recommend it? No, I wouldn't recommend it. Would I do it again? No, I wouldn't even do it again. But why did you want to do it in the first place? Because I'd been to the gym, I guess, long enough that you had to have some kind of a goal. This was kind of an interesting goal for me, and it, and, um, it was a challenge. And it wasn't, I don't want to let any, mis, mislead anybody. It's not like we're hanging on cliffs roped together climbing Mount Everest. Okay, This is a strenuous hike. Stop. It's high. And that's fine, that's the altitude problems you deal with, but it's not technical. And so it was just kind of a challenge, and, um, and uh, like I said, we had a great guide, and uh, he got us up there. And it, I don't, it, it's more, I, I look upon it more fondly now the further I'm away from it, because when I was up there, I thought, this is a real drag. Like it, it, <laughs> You know, it was. It, it, imagine you're that high. There's no vegetation. It's not particularly pretty. The view you're is look. Up. The view is look at the clouds. People are throwing up around you, and uh, you know that's not what I like to do in my two weeks off every six years. Yeah, but yet you were goal oriented. You made it to the top. Yeah. And what was it? What did it feel like? Euphoric, anticlimactic. What was the actual line in that? Really anticlimactic because there's so many people trying to go up there in so many different routes that when you climb this this one of the seven great peaks, you would hope that you might have a moment of solitude. You, you know. don't. <laughs> You know, there's McDonald's in. No, there's, yeah, <laughs> there, there, there's a bunch of Sherpas who pulled up the group from the west, and a bunch from the east, and somebody. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people up there. Not a lot. There's like 20 people up there, plus your own people, and uh, and then you start watching your leader start to hallucinate. You think we got to get out of here, right? Because we got to get down, and down's a bitch. Because the last day you you, you climb. 3,500 feet, you start at midnight. You climb about 3,500 feet. It takes you six, seven hours, and then you get it done, and then you got to go down from 19,540 feet to 10. And that is a grind like you can't believe because it's all shale and you slip and this and that. And it's a long, long day. You get in about 6 o'clock at night. All right, and your knees go. Yeah, and you can't eat. You know, and it's funny about all of it too because 
every time you even unroll your sleeping bag and roll it up, well, it's exhausting. Yeah. You, know, you end up taking about five or six, uh, about eight steps to the breath up there, which is nothing like Everest if you watch that IMAX thing, which is spectacular when they're taking like 20, 20 breaths to the step. But, you know, and then I got these guys, these guys you go climb with, they think they make it, half of them got pushed up by the Sherpas there because they were out of it. And uh, then they say, they phone up like uh, two weeks ago and said, you know, how about this mountain in Argentina? Like it's, you know, it's like 2,000 feet higher. I said, don't you get it? You don't even remember getting up there. They're dragging you by the back of your head, you know, but they, they, they want to, it's all these accountants and bullshit people that, you know, want to do something risky for once. So. Right. But it, I mean, people that know you very well and, and, you know, words out in the street that you've mellowed. Yeah. That's partly a result of that? No. I don't think so. And I, you've mellowed so much, I've noticed. In the last, yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's aging, Denise, it's called, you know. And I think you get a bit more secure with what you do. Mm. And, I, and I think, you know, we, we, Randy and I talk in the office all the time, is it like we know what we're doing, and we just got to not put up with this bullshit anymore and just do it. And if people don't want us to do it, then see ya. Mm. We'll get somebody who wants to work with us. And that's, I think we've only come to that realization probably in the last year and a half. You know? does, it, does it bother you that, that, you know, you've been in the business a long time, and then last little, a little while, especially in Canada, you know, we're at Donald's uh, everlasting retirement today, <laughs> and uh, Stan last night, and Joe last year, and the Universal Polygram merger, and all the rest of that that's going on. Like, your network, the people that were controlling all these things, are now not controlling anymore. So you either have to build new bridges. Are you, are, are you doing that? Are you prepared? Can your team continue to break acts? I think so. But it's, it's very troubling to me to watch guys that I've been in the business for a long time get dismissed or drop out of the business of, the, uh, uh, of their own accord. And it's, it's been really troubling to me, the universal polygram merger to me in many ways because I lost a guy like Al Kafaro, who I thought Cheryl Crow was one of the classiest things I've ever seen on the Grammys where she thanked him for everything he's done. I was very sad to see a gentleman like David Munsgo, who's probably one of the finest international talents this this country or any country has ever produced. Um, I, I think it's wrong. I think, it, I think the universal polygram was not a merger of talent. It was a complete takeover. And I don't think some of the right people got the jobs. I was very happy in the States when I we did get taken over. And I was thrilled that even before the ink was dry, well, that he wasn't even supposed to talk to me, that Jimmy Iovine took the time to fly up to Vancouver, have a talk to me and, and assure me that he would look after us um, and I've had meetings with Ted Fields, who I found delightful, and also uh, Tom Wally, who instigated these meetings on their own behalf. And I thought that was wonderful. I am very, de de I'm very upset that, uh, not upset, but I find it, it concerns me that uh, Brian Adams, one of the biggest acts this country has ever produced, I have not yet met one new individual from Universal outside of Alan Reed, who moved over there from a &M. I got a call from Ross Reynolds saying everything was going to be okay, but if I was Randy Lennox or if I was some of those upper management people, I would have been on a plane, now maybe they don't like to fly, but I fly all the time, I've been away for a month on this trip, but I would have flown out to Vancouver or to New York and, or got me and Brian together to talk to us. Because I think it's like baseball. If you're going to get traded, you want the general manager, the other team to phone you up and say, hey, welcome. That's all you want. Okay, you just want to be welcome, and I feel we haven't been made welcome yet, and I, I find it really distasteful. Well, they're they're busy. What You're are they busy be doing? Don't what are they worry. busy doing? Because <laughs> we're the guys who are going to supply them the product. Mm -hmm. You look after the talent. That's what you look after, not the receptionist. Okay, you look after me. I'm going to supply you. Your, I'm going to make money for you. Your business is selling records. Okay, I make those records. I make money in a lot more different ways than just selling records, but a record company makes them selling records. So welcome me aboard, take me out to dinner, pretend you love me. I'll buy it, okay? <laughs> You'll buy dinner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what, what do you think about the bigger implications for the industry? We're talking, you know, five, and then people are saying it's going to be four, and then it's going to be three, and all of that. What do you think? It's tough because our job as a managers, we fight for priority all the time. There's, it used to be maybe you're fighting with 30 guys. Now with these mergers, you're fighting with 100 acts mm. to get to get notice and to get to get help and to and to to get somebody to listen to you. I think it's going to be tough, but I also think it's going to be, give rise to some great independence. And I think people are going to go to where they think they're going to get attention. And if they don't feel they're going to get attention from acts with 200 labels on it, uh, then they're going to go look for something else. And I think that's why Donald K. Donald sat there. Donald opened an independent label. I think there's going to be a lot more independent labels opening. And uh, I think that uh, that. Uh, 
sure, the guy's going to open them and hope they're going to get swallowed up by a major, but they are going to break some acts. Yeah. They are going to break some acts because the, the guys that do that usually have some passion for this business. And unfortunately, I don't think there's a lot of guys now in some of these companies that have a real passion. Although I'm very happy to be at Interscope down the States because Jimmy Iovine always has had passion for this business. He comes from a producer background, so he is a passionate guy and, he, and I can kind of relate to him. And uh, he, it's fun to talk to him because all of a sudden he has to deal with like human resources. <laughs> he never got in the business ever to deal with human resources. And these people were coming in and say, okay, you know, some guy in a German accent saying, you know, You've got to have so many women, you've got to have so many blacks, you've got to have so many people who are over 40, so many people. Are, and he, just, he just sent him down to Ted Fields, who, of course, one time bought the Chicago Tribune and fired everybody, and he could deal with human resources. But <laughs> Jimmy said, I never thought, I, I just want to make records, I just want to make music. I got this guy looking like Darth Vader telling me, it's, you know, I got to hire and fire so many people. It's, it's tough for those guys, too. Yeah. It's tough because there's some real passionate people in this business that don't want to get caught up in this corporate crap. And that's what it is. Well, you talk about the independents coming and the resurgence of the power of the independents. And a lot of the independents these days, you know, they're very hungry, aggressive, young people who are yep. very technologically advanced. They're, they love the internet. They, you don't own a computer, right? No, I don't. Okay. Me and Silverman are the same. He doesn't have one either. Okay. <laughs> well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and I'm going to show you this thing, and I'm sure you've seen it. Don't be afraid. Okay. <laughs> it's a real, ooh. Yeah. $200 piece of gear. Yeah. Right, you can download digital quality audio. Yes, and when you play it, and if you play, if you recorded something off that Denise off your computer, and then recorded a CD, mm -hmm. you couldn't tell the difference. Bang on. So, what does this mean for the future? This little thing right here. Well, it's quite scary. It's quite scary for the people who hold copyrights, but I think it's really scary, and I think that in that, I think the artists haven't even come to grips with it yet. But I think the record companies really are, and I hope that they do get a grip on it because I don't think you should be able to take people's works of art for free. I don't think you should be able to pirate it. So I hope they get it together and I think they will. There's a way that they, they, could, they could get it done and I certainly don't know how, but I found it interesting that when they had, when they gave it to a MIT in the States and they gave it to the students to work up how they could, uh, how they could protect it, put a protection or a block or something on these things, that uh, all the students walked out of class and wouldn't report to classes until they got rid of that project out of, out of MIT because they wanted to steal all the music for free. So it's kind of interesting. So it's, it's going to be an interesting battle, but it, we, we'll solve it. Mm -hmm. We'll solve it. You know, this internet thing too, it's, we're talking all the time about <clears throat> people buying records off the internet. Well, I'm on the, on the country music uh, board down there, uh, CMA board, and we have people come and talk to us all the time, and I, I, I kind of fascinated with you know, Borders uh, or uh, Amazon.com and, and stuff like that. And so they said, if you took Boulevard.com and Amazon.com and all the rest of these .com people that are selling records, the total volume for a year that these people do is exactly the same as one tower store hmm. for a year between all that. So it's really not that big yeah. yet. And I don't know if it's going to be big because I still think it's an experience to go down to the record store and go through the stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, I, I don't think it's just going to, take over our business totally. I think we're still going to, people still want to touch and feel product. Mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah, well, <laughs> except there's no live acts for them to see anymore. That's right. The old people are going to see the live acts. The old people matter. are because the tickets are 300 bucks. <laughs> um, it, it, let, let's bounce around for a, a number of subjects here. She said diving through her notes. Um, you know, everybody knows all about your, your huge successes. I mean, you've got at, currently, right on your roster, Adams, 20 odd years. Martina, Anne Marie, Leroy Parnell, Kim Stockerty, Conline Crush, Bret Hart. In the past, has been BTO, Loverboy, Cochrane, Prism, yeah. Susan Jacks, Red Reiner, Leona Boyd, The Paolas, Tad Campbell, Raymond May, Hammersmith. Boyd, there's a lot of stiffs. I forgot all those. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what what do you think? Is there is the failure kind of regret? What about Penta? Like Penta was set up. Yeah, Penta was fine, set up. Fine, strong but people. Yeah, fine, strong people, but people really weren't interested. No. You know, I, I wasn't really interested. I look back now, I'm not interested in running a record company. And um, that was too bad. It was a pretty good situation. Could have been a good situation. It was, you know, Sam's got stuff to do. Fairbird's got stuff to do. We all had stuff to do and we were pretty successful. I think you really got to focus on that. And, and maybe, you know, who was running the company wasn't the right guy. I don't know, but it, it, it just never worked. And, you know, you look upon failures, the big failures. I've had. I think Tom Cochran was a major failure. I think this guy is one of the um, best writers I've ever been involved with. Just a shitty live act, but a great writer. And if I knew more, I, I, I think I could, if I had to do that all over again, I could figure out how to do it. I think Sam went to a show the other night, he loves Cochran. He went, um, even though he stiffed us about 100 grand, he loves Cochran, but he, he, um, he went to a, he went to a, 
<laughs> Good. He went to a show and saw it at the Vogue Theater, and he said it was fabulous, and I believe him. Yeah. Because I think Tom now is going out and doing what he should have done when I have, and I didn't have the foresight in that to do that. And uh, the, like an unplugged thing yeah. comes along. It's great for a Tom Cochran. Yeah. So that was a big failure. And all the rest of this, you know, you know, Hammersmith, that's a thing where you help out Randy's pal, and uh, you're not really into it. That goes down the drain. And you know, there, there, there's certain, certain things that you do for the wrong reasons. But when you do something for the right reasons, usually you can have a certain amount of success with it. Yeah, so you think you've streamlined yourself right to the point. I, I keep thinking, you know, you climb the mountain, you, you're, you know, 50-odd now, you know, that life's full of possibilities, you've got all the money you ever want. Like, does it make you feel, what's the one thing in my life that I still want to do and I haven't done it yet? Are there things on a list like that? No. No? No, not at all. But um, you must be motivated by different things now. I'm not, you know, I, I kind of, I'm kind of motivated to... I kind of motivated to stay there, you know. It's you know, I I, I have real unbelievable insecurities. You know, when when back return overdrive came along, and we had the success with it, people said, well, you know, he would have done it. Randy'd already been there. Without Randy back then, he couldn't have made it. Randy, and Randy brought a lot to the party. Had a lot of experience. Then Loverboy came around. Yeah, he never found Loverboy. Lou Blair found Loverboy. Brought it to Bruce, and he couldn't find shit. And then so, okay, then you go out there and say, okay, now, Brian, well, nobody's knocking Brian because that was my thing from the beginning, but, but what else am I going to do, Denise? I mean, you know, you sit there, what else am I going to do, you know? Record companies, it's funny, Doc McGee and I sit there and they watch all these guys get hired to run record companies, and guys like Doc and, and, uh, and myself and mentioned Bernstein and managers have been around for years and years and years have probably forgot about more about rec running record companies or the record business than most of these guys who are running them know. But we, we never get asked for a job, you know, we never, we loved, I mean, it would be my dream to have a job that I could totally fuck up and get a golden parachute of $10 million. Say, <laughs> I love that for myself. You know, to good. say, hey, we're <laughs> sorry, to we're, America. we're sorry, you tried, here's 10 million bucks, <laughs> right. you know, and see ya, you know. Man, I mean, it's unbelievable. Mm. It's, 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 it's what's with our business. <laughs> you hired to fire. These guys sit down there. They work out their deals with their termination thing built in. Right. They're already planning to get tossed. It's unreal. <laughs> You've got all, most of your artists are on different labels. Yeah. And so there's got to be some real uh, strategic advantages to that for you. For me, yes. Yeah. Because like Joe Galante in Nashville. Joe Galante has one of the best programs I've ever seen that he does for managers. Mm. And nobody has picked up on it. And I told everybody about it, everybody about it, and they just sit there and don't know how to do it. And what he does, he, ha he calls it a day of dialogue. And he says, I have every manager, we go down about twice a year, maybe three times a year. He gets all the managers in and he invites in the head of distribution and the head of like Russ Solomon or all, these, or, or, or all the people that are involved in the distribution of records. And all the managers sit there and the artists if they want, and they get to sit there in a little room you know, little, there's not many people, maybe 20, and they get to ask questions, and they get to hear his problems, and, our, and, and then we get to tell them our problems, and you get to learn about the business from these people. And next, we, next time it might be about radio, so some of the big radio programmers come down, or some, and, and, some of the, uh, and some of the chain guys come down, mm. uh, and, they, and then we talk about the problems, because it's easy, if you're an artist, to sit there and curse the world and everybody's, everybody's screwing you over, but until you get in a dialogue with these people and see where they're coming from, before, before if you don't get a chance to understand where the, how these people think, you're never going to be able to, to, to deal with them. And I, th I, tell Joe, I tell Joe, I said, Joe, and I, I, mean, I know this shit. I've been doing it a long time, but I go anyway. And I, because it's fascinating to me to, to, to listen to these people. And I think these record companies in this country and down in the state should have these days of dialogues for the managers to sit there so they can actually not, not sit in the back of the tour bus bitching about life, Talk to the guy who's fucking up your life and ask him what he's doing to fix it and why it is that way. I think everybody could benefit from it. There's a lot of acts that have, uh, you know, the Canadians are constantly, especially lately, talking about all the great acts that are doing well internationally, and yet there's still a lot of great acts in Canada that haven't crossed out, haven't made a success in America. Why don't you name them? Why don't I name them? Yeah. There's a lot of people I would love to see do who's that? wonderful, I think the Tragically Hip would do them. Tragically Hip has had their chances. They've had their chances with four labels. Get over it. It isn't going to happen. But they're this year's trooper. Not true. What do you, you mean not true? Not true. They've been with Universal, they've been with Atlantic, they've been with Sire, aren't they? I mean, how many chances do you want? <laughs> so what, tell me what the problem There's is. There's something for... wrong, isn't there, Denise? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's something wrong and you haven't figured it out. Because I go Maybe to see the, the tragic Maybe it's the fat, ugly guy singing. Wrong. No, see. 
Earlier you were talking about not want, you're going to see live acts and there, there's no, it's not resonating. It's live acts, you, it's Denise, they're live, it. come on, stop that crap. It's, I have, so, I've had them too. I've had prison, we could sell out, we sold out Coliseums coast to coast. They weren't good enough. Trooper, they sold out Coliseums coast to coast. They weren't good enough. And Tragic Hips doing it now. Well, they're good enough so for me. So get over it. Good enough for me. They better be good enough for you. You're playing the shit out of them, keeping the myth alive. Yeah. I'm proud of that I am too. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway. Okay, we're getting really close to being out of time because I don't want to fight with them anymore. No, I do. Um, but so, what a couple of things I wanted to do with you is go through, um, like, Billboard Top 10 this week, right? Tell oh, me what great. you think. <laughs> Number one, TLC. <laughs> no box set there. Okay. Number two, Eminem. M I like it. Yeah? Yeah, I, 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 Jimmy played it for me. It's on Interscope, right? Mm. Uh, have you really got into the record? No, I haven't. We just got one video. Uh, wait to get into the record. Listen to the lyrics. It's great. This kid's a, a white rapper mm -hmm. who's involved with um, Dr. Dre. And it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. But it's really violent and really coarse. And a lot, a lot of the stuff, I don't know if you'll be able to play it. But it's, mm. it's a pretty neat to listen to. It's, but it's more like a comedy act mm. when you listen to it. Go ahead. Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill? Lauren Hill once said in an interview that she would rather have her kids starve than sell records to white people. I heard that was a vicious rumor that she, that she says didn't happen. She didn't I say I bet she it. says it didn't happen. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what to think of Lauren Hill. I don't like the record. Next. Uh, Dixie Chicks. Pretty neat. Um, a lot of, lot of, lot of spot, great girls, um, great image, good players, good singers. Going to be around a while. Shania, you almost managed her for a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and interesting. You did um, it because no, no. Interesting. <laughs> it, it didn't because of a couple of reasons, but but Mutt Lang is probably the most gifted producer maybe the world has ever known. He's had hit metal acts with Def Leppard or ACDC. He's had hit pop acts with Brian. He's had hit black acts or uh, R&B acts with Billy Ocean. He's had, and now a country act that might be the biggest country act of all time by the time she finishes selling records. You have to ask, your question, ask, ask the question, where would Shania be without Mutt? I don't think it's a bad question to ask. You could also say the same about Brian. We're coming off a bad record and Mutt Lang did a great job with us getting us refocused and helped Brian in the writing of songs. And I think he's done the same thing with Shania. What's great about Shania is that she goes out there and she is committed to her craft. She works her ass off. She's focused. And when she comes and does her show, everybody who goes to that show loves it. It's a great show. And I applaud her because she's done a, a wonderful job. And her so, and I, but I also don't want to, don't want to, don't want to, uh, to, to, to um, not focus on the on the uh, on the contribution of Mutt Lang, who is a, a genius of a of a producer. The next one is a Grammy compilation, so we'll see. Yeah, well, that. you know what that is. Share. Oh. <laughs> you ever seen Share close lately? <laughs> and she doesn't move her face. No, it's yeah. frightening. She never moves her face. Um, great song proves. Mm. Brian always says to me, "We're always one song away. You're always one song away." And he's right. Here comes this broad, all of a sudden, out of nowhere. She's got a great song, and it is a great song. And I don't know whether she'll have a second great song, but hey, that's a great song. Britney Spears. That's your musketeer. Um, and we won't hear of her maybe in another 20 months. Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you, uh, well, last question before we get to our word association test. Oh, good. Which is the end. I thought that was that. No, 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 that was just messing around. Um, is uh, Canadian radio, state of Canadian radio. I have a problem, but it's not, it's not, it's a big problem in a way, is that I've always been involved with artists that when I started, you made a record and you put out that record, and if it was a record that went on that format, then that format played it. I find it tough now in this country that we have to supply them with remixes. If I was an artist and I spent months and months and months creating my art, and then I went into the marketing department or the 
promotion department, and they said, we've taken your work and sent it over to this guy, who's taken it down to his basement and fed it through a bunch of computers, and we're gonna come up with another mix because we need more radio to get the single up the charts. If I was an artist, I'd be really pissed. Like, who would have ever made that call to Bob Dylan to take his songs and turn them into dance mixes or something like that? But that's what we're in now, is that they take your art, they say, we don't like it. Why don't you do it like this? That sucks. Mm. Brian got remixed once. Yes. We How played... high that vocal, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, that was early in the day. He, that was early, but we've also, we also play the remix game now a bit. Mm. And it's difficult. It's hard to sell to an artist. Mm. It's tough. But that's the game we're in again. It's like Paola. We're, we're in that game, so we did it. Now we're in this remix game. So how about the consumer who goes and buys a jewel record that she heard on the radio, and it's got nothing to do with what she bought on the CD? Mm. Pretty tough. I think the, computers, the, the consumer's getting shafted, too. Okay, we're wrapping up. We have no time left. Bruce and I talked uh, last week, and he said that he'd been to a couple of these sessions like this, and uh, they ended with a word association. So I've got about 20 words. Well, I knew you hadn't done this for a few years, Denise, so I'm trying to give you a tip. Thanks. <laughs> Hey, I'm listening. And I'll go to the dialogue thing. I'm always in first for new information. Okay, I'm going to say one word. You're going to give me one word back. Is that it? I'll try. Or give me whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, ego. Got to have it to be a success. Money. Define success. Canadian. Pretty good thing to be, although the government is doing everything they can to drive us out of here. Why? Well, look at how much money they're taking from us. Who would put up with this crap? Why do you think all the artists are left? And the hockey players. Media. Media? You can use them. <laughs> As I believe I have been this afternoon. Uh, fame. Fame? To some, to some people it's not really important, but they just say that because they're afraid to attain it. Facial hair. Lazy. <laughs> Retirement. The divorce set me back. <laughs> <laughs> Slander. Expensive. <laughs> CRTC. Outdated. Not Sex. Thing. Sex? Viagra, it's getting a hell of a lot better. Oh, damn. Viagra is one of my words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, image. Very, very, very important these days. You have to know what you, you it, it's critical. It's, it's the second, the next biggest thing to the song. Millennium. Big payday, New Year's. Greed. Greed? A downfall for anybody. Art. Being usurped by the system we're in now. Capital punishment. Vote for it tomorrow. Education. Um, I tell my kids I'm important. It's important, but I don't know if I totally buy it yet. You you got your grade twelve. Yeah. And that's it. I got a couple of grades, a couple of years of university. No one wanted to give you an honorary degree. No, it'll come. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, liposuction. Life section. Liposuction. Lipo Lipo liposuction. Shortcut. <laughs> uh, women. Love them. Um, I have the, a full staff of women. Most dedicated individuals I've ever been involved with and do a much better job than a lot of the men in this industry. You know, we talked about working together once about 20 years ago. Did we? Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bruce told me that he had a whole office full of women and the reason that was was because they never want to be managers. And oh, I never, said, thanks never, very much, goodbye. No, they never want to take my job away. They just want to be treated equally. And now they, the girls are so well adjusted now, they actually give me a menopausal calendar every year, but it's the first of the year, and they have it listed when, they're, when that period of time comes every month. It's quite interesting. That's menopausal actually only comes once. No, not menopausal, okay, sorry. So. They're period, period uh, <laughs> cycles. And I, I, menstrual cycles, I guess it is. And I, I find it hilarious. I find it hilarious. But they're great girls, and... Um, I'm blessed to have them, as I am the one male in the office, Randy, mm -hmm. who's been with me a long time. Actually, the only job he's ever had as an adult. 
<laughs> what a statement. Uh, okay. Thanks very much, everybody. I have no idea what goes on next, so enjoy.